Now we heard Mike the use of Ethereum once upon a time. Well, actually, in our next session, we're going to hear from Vitalik Buterin, who is the founder of Ethereum Foundation, on what is the definition of the value exchange layer of the internet. We also hope to get his insights on how Web 3.0 and the finance industry converge and what transformation it will bring to institutions and individuals. This conversation will be moderated by Raul Pal, who's a co-founder and chief executive officer of Real Vision. We'll now join Raul and Vitalik for their discussion on building the value exchange layer of the internet. Hi, Vitalik, how are you? I'm good, how, how, how are you all? I'm um, great, thank you. Um, what a day to speak to you with Ethereum at all time highs and the whole cryptocurrency complex at all time highs. Could you imagine when you first came up with this idea that you have dreamed up over half a trillion dollars of value so far within the idea of smart contracts in the Ethereum ecosystem. I mean, honestly, no. Well, like when, when I started it, I kind of I kind of expected it would be just to this kind of tiny side project, and we'd get it done in a couple of months, and then I'd go back to university. Um, so no, I mean, I was de definitely not did not expect this for Ethereum. I mean, did not expect this uh, level of just size and attention for the crypto space in general. No, I mean, uh, the thing that you really did um, with smart contracts was unlocking the value layer. You know, it, it, what it created was everything that we've seen over the last year, this explosion of, of DeFi, NFTs, and now everybody's moving towards Web 3.0 and the, you know, has staking now, and that's creating a whole new eco ecosystem. How are you seeing the DeFi ecosystem develop? Mm, um, again, I think, like, first of all, the DeFi ecosystem is definitely maturing. Um, just the fact that these projects are continuing to survive um and uh, like obviously there is like a lot of the kind of ones around the edges that uh, like th that get hacked from time to time but if you just focus on like the core ones like the ones that have existed for a few years like you know the maker uniswap like all of the like ones that just people have been working on since the beginning they're just continuing to be stable, continuing to do what people want them to do, continuing to just, you know, grow and just provide the, you know, whatever the functionality that people have been expecting for, of them. And I think trust in those platforms is just continuing to, incre uh, continuing to increase. And that by itself, I think, is just going to make people more and more comfortable over time in uh, being able to rely on these platforms. Um, so I think... The, the trends that we're going to start seeing over the next few years is basically just okay, just more ongoing adoption, like more kinds of people um, using um, DeFi. Um, the NFT space that we uh, just uh, had a panel about right before this, right? That's uh, like, I think that's an interesting example of uh, something that I've been talking about like with regard to the crypto space for a long time, which is that like, I don't think the, the, the future is financial or non-financial. I think it's kind of mixed financial. Like I think it's uh, projects that are not just about money in nature, but that still benefit a lot from being directly plugged into this kind of massive value layer that we've uh, cr created, you know, with the kind of Ethereum and the greater crypto ecosystem. Like, you know, if you have an NFT, um, you know, you, you, like buying and selling it requires an auction, that's smart contracts. Um, like if you buy it, you might be buying it with a coin. Often a coin is DAI and DAI is itself created by a DeFi platform. Um, so there's just like DeFi components that are being plugged in um, all over the place, right? And like Ethereum does not have a killer app, it has a killer ecosystem. Like the value comes from all of these different uh, pieces that are able to talk to each other. So I expect that as we see more um, adoption, more work in NFTs, um, in say um, the block the blockchain gaming space, in a kind of you know quote the metaverse as uh, people start slowly figuring out you know what the heck that word actually uh, actually means <laughs> in the yeah, blockchain context um the um, you know as we people keep uh, figuring out how like what daos are actually for like all of these things are going to plug into financial layers of uh, different kinds right and you know there's different kinds of financial layers there's like the you know the decentralized exchanges uh, there's the stable coins um there's all of the different versions of all of those things. There's different kinds of markets. And as 
more of these new applications keep bringing in new users, I think we're going to just see all these basic building blocks just keep on uh, kind of prospering, growing, um, st stabilizing themselves. Um, we'll, like people will see more and more like w w which parts of DeFi lands are really here to stay, and the parts of DeFi land that are here to stay yeah, are you know, like. I think they're. I think they really will be here to stay, and I think we're going to just see a lot of uh, a, just a lot of value kind of slowly and steadily coming out of them. Yeah, I think a lot of people mistakenly think of DeFi, as you say, as mm -hmm. just this part of a financial system that's disintermediating the banks. Mm -hmm. But actually, what's going on is it feels like there's an entirely new parallel financial system and mm -hmm. economic system that's being built. It's mm -hmm. it's a whole ecosystem. It's not just about mm -hmm. finance. Mm -hmm. That that value layer of the NFT space has been fascinating because it's kind of exploded and it's very nascent right now. Because you know we've got some of the leading projects with you know CryptoPunks and Board Ape Yacht Club. People are kind of coalescing around these communities, but it feels like it's still very early with where NFTs are going. Mm -hmm. Where do you think they might be headed? Are we going to see intellectual property rights, all sorts of other things on NFTs, insurance contracts? How are you? How are you thinking this might develop? Um, I think it's. Um, I mean, we're like NFTs in general. First of all, are like a really big category, right? Like the word just uh, like literally stands for non fungible token, and so like it literally just is like the entire subset of tokens where instead of a token that has many units that all represent the same thing, it's a token where each individual unit represents a different thing. Like that's big, right? Like pieces of art are NFTs. Um, ENS domain names are NFTs. Um, like items in video games, like uh, are NFTs, like things in loot projects are uh, NFTs, right? Like, so we're going to see many different kinds of NFTs. Um, some NFTs are going to represent things that are purely crypto native, so whose value basically only comes from people within the crypto space being willing to pay attention to them. And there's also going to be NFTs that represent um, assets that have some kind of legal power in the uh, in the yeah, physical world. Like, I mean, intellectual property rights are one example. Real estate is another example. Like, just like we have stable coins, right? Like, we have the algorithmic stable coins that are kind of purely crypto-based um, and then we also have like USDC, like I mean, institutionally backed crypto uh, stable coins that are pointers to like dollars that are being held in bank accounts. So you know, same with NFTs. Like we have NFTs that will have their value entirely derived from things happening in crypto land, and we'll have NFTs that have uh, value that come from you know connections to um, you know like existing legal property rights that we um, that we already have, but that maybe are currently not that efficient to kind of like actually use in interesting ways and do things with. Yeah, and this and the element of composability around all of this allows there to be lending markets that build around these NFTs as well. So that's where kind of we're starting to see lending markets developing around some of the artwork mm -hmm. and other bits and pieces. Yep. And you can just mm -hmm. see that all of these bits of the jigsaw are starting to build on top of each other at a ridiculous mm -hmm. rate. Exactly. I think uh, there's there's a lot of different combinations that are really fun. Like just to give a couple of examples, like one is uh, the concept of fractional ownership. Um, like you could see that being applied to NFTs. You could see that even be applied to NFTs representing real estate. Um, you could see NFTs being linked together with DAOs. Um, so like think of something like a condominium association, right? Like if NFTs become real estate ownership, then a condominium association can just be a DAO. And you know, instead of it being governed through like these boring, like often pen and paper based 20th century processes, you can just like, you know, have all the votes just like happen through some uh, contract on chain, right? So there's a lot of different ways to kind of connect each and every one of these, like, uh, every one of these components. And like most of the interesting applications, I think, end up connecting different pieces together already. Yeah, one of the things about tokenizing real estate that's super interesting to me is a lot of real estate that performs well is expensive. And most mm -hmm. people can't participate. The moment you tokenize it, anybody can participate. Anybody can put 5% mm -hmm. of their savings mm -hmm. in a $100 million property. And that's exactly. an, it's an extraordinary change. And liquidity mm -hmm. of real estate markets is going to change forever once this starts happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think like, I mean, in real estate specifically, right, like the the non fungibility of, uh, of it is like, in, in many ways, you can see it as like, a, a as a source of just a huge number of problems, right? Because 
Like, you know, if you live in a city today, you're either you're either you're a homeowner, in which case you're just massively overexposed to one asset, or you're a renter, in which case you're negatively exposed to like to, to that asset. And you're even like you could say negatively exposed to like basically your community being a good place to live. Right. So like have it, giving people access to options that are kind of in between those two extremes on that spectrum, like partial ownership, some kind of uh, kind of like uh, system where ownership builds up over time. I'm using crypto um, like loans to be able to actually you know, like uh, actually facilitate that. I think uh, you know there's there's lots of opportunities for really cool things to happen there. The other thing that um, you mentioned that is coming fast on the scene and everybody's trying to figure this out at DAOs. How are you yes. thinking about DAOs and how effective are they going to be? What format are they going to take? I mean, there's a lot of experimentation going mm -hmm. on. It feels that hmm. sometimes it's difficult to have such a broad ownership of projects because without a specific leader, we're trying to figure out how this is all going to work. How do you see the evolution of DAOs and yeah, you know, how are you framing it yourself right now? Sure. Um, I think uh, DAO, I, I view this stuff as being like DAOs and smart contracts as being like legal for governance. Right, like it basically just like is this platform that makes it really easy for people to tinker, for people to come up with new with new and different constructions, and that's not something that we're that's really been available for people before, right? Like right now, if you want to create an organization, like you have to pay lawyers a huge amount in order to do it. Um, and like that just costs tens of thousands of dollars. It costs a lot of delays. And if instead, like you create something that's just really turnkey um, and it really reduces the cost for people to do those kinds of things, then like I think we could easily see organiz these organizations become a lot less standardized. There'd be a lot of a lot more different kinds of them that are tailored to different kinds of situations more small scale flash organizations. Um, so just things that exist only for a couple of months or only for a very specific purpose, even with a very small amount of uh, amount of money in them. Um, so I like I don't see one uh, kind of dominating use case. I just see it opening up the floodgates for a thousand different experiments. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I'm seeing that's really interesting is the fund management industry is now being mm -hmm. crowdsourced based around mm -hmm. a DAO um, mm -hmm. and as you say, the cost is so minimal to set these things up that it's mm -hmm. hugely disruptive for this very traditional business of managing money. Absolutely, it is. Hmm. Um, so how are you thinking about the other <laughs> thing is all of this feels like that this is all the building blocks for what we're referring to as Web 3.0. Now, everybody's yes. got their own definition of that, like everybody's got their own definition of the metaverse. What mm -hmm. is your definition of Web 3.0, your working definition? Because it will change over time as everybody does. And mm -hmm. how far are we in that in this process? Um, yeah, so I think, um, I mean, Web 3.0 is obviously a very big term. I, I think there's a lot of different um, things that uh, different uh, people are excited about. Um, like there's uh, people who are excited about, like say, creating more decentralized forms of, like say, social media that might have more open and transparent governance, um, creating uh, ways like some kind of integ like better integration between internet applications and uh, the finance layer, um, at, or um, just like adding on the capability to have assets in general and to have like this notion of permanent ownership uh, kind of that's not dependent on um, some single institution facilitating it uh, being like a much more base uh, part of the internet. There's uh, I mean, obviously just kind of the D5 uh, vision itself, um, different ways for people to monetize. Like there's all these different things that uh, people want to do. And I mean, Web3 is definitely a, a very big umbrella term that co um, that co covers all of these things, which I think is okay, right? I mean, I think, you know, there is a big revolution happening here, right? There's, uh, like, there are these uh, technologies, I mean, I think, like, not just blockchains, uh, zero knowledge proofs are also a yeah, really big and important one. And these technologies are, you know, doing a really important uh, job uh, or, of uh, making it possible to do all of these things um, that were not possible before, solving all the, solving trust problems, allowing more collaboration without central trust points to happen, and lots of people have like lots of different um, you know opinions, visions, and dreams about what kinds of things could and uh, should be done with those ideas, which I think is amazing. Um, so yeah, I think one of, it, one, again, of the, one of the key 
one of the key things missing from all of this still, I think, mm -hmm. is the wallet experience, the, mm -hmm. uh, the kind of ubiquitous wallet experience. And the other thing is that zero knowledge proof identity layer that I think we need mm -hmm. for the internet, that many of us share this idea that we shouldn't give all of our information to everybody. And the, I think many people's vision of Web 3.0 is that we hold our own data. And if we want mm -hmm. to sell our data, we can. How, how far is this along from before we get to that usability where we get the digital identity and wallets that are not so difficult mm -hmm. to set up? <laughs> Sure. Uh, I mean, I think in practice, uh, the biggest uh, usability challenge at this point is just the transaction fees, right? And like layer two pro protocols are the solution to that, right? Like, you know, in Ethereum land, you know, we have Optimism, Arbitrum, Polygon, um, increasingly the zero knowledge family. Um, so I think it's um, like all of these, uh, th uh, you know, it's great that all these uh, things are happening, um, but I, uh, so like, and I think once that happens, then like the, the biggest practical usability problem that's I'm in front of users today, like basically disappears. There are other usability problems too. Like I think the other really big one is the fact that most people are not really set up well to fully like be like manage their like existing cryptocurrency wallets and like make sure they don't lose all of these digital assets. Like we're basically talking about like potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars that are under the control of a cryptographic key, right? And that's not really a model that people are necessarily used to in a world where most valuable things are things where like if people go wrong, you can, you know, go and talk to the bank or you can go and talk to the court or the police or whoever else and they'll figure things out. Um, and but there are solutions in um, the yeah, uh, uh, crypto space that be, are like, uh, they're trying to solve the problem and uh, like reduce the chance of like reduce the chance that thing, funds get lost, reduce the chance that funds get stolen. Just make people feel um, kind of uh, safer when handling these um, assets. Um, things like social recovery wallets, uh, multi-sig wallets like different kind of hybrid institutional forms of custody where some institution can help serve as a backup without that institution actually having the ability to like, like just uh, take, or without that institution having like the ability to, to control that asset completely. Um, so there's a lot of important work being done in uh, those areas as well. Um, and, but I think, um, you know, all of these problems are going to just slowly start to get uh, solved over the next couple of years. And so I'm really excited about that. So, I mean, what you talked before a bit about this being a revolution. I talked about it being that as well. I mean, this is the fastest adoption of any technology in all human history. Um, it's growing at twice the speed that the internet adoption did back in when it had the same number of users. It's mm -hmm. there's so much going on, as we've just talked about. I mean, the whole space has exploded in depth, um, not only in the number of different protocols, but the use cases of everything as well. So how should a country like Singapore or any country mm. think mm -hmm. through a revolution that's happening this fast? Because it's a bit unsettling for mm -hmm. countries, let alone companies. Um, mm -hmm. How should they think it through? Sure. Um, so I think there is a couple of different angles to think it through from. Um, I mean, one angle is just like how to be supportive of good projects um, that are trying to make all of this happen locally, right? And like, I think Singapore is in a yeah, potentially good position to do a lot of that. Like it's already a financial hub. It's already a yeah, legal registration hub. Um, so if people end up wanting to do projects that involve like either like uh, like say NFTs that are backed by some kind of legal property rights, then you know basing them in Singapore might be a great choice for some for people to do. Um, and if people start doing that, then you know the, like the, there's the question for the uh, you know Singapore government of like what can they yeah, do to make it easier for people to do, do those kinds of things. So that's one possible angle. Um, so like like for those crypto projects that do um, incorporate some form of uh, institutional trust. Like how you know, like how can it can better serve as uh, the the trust anchor? The second project uh, way to look at it is, um, of course, looking at it from the kind of user side and like looking at it from the point of view of well, what are specific um, applications that could that could be valuable and could make a lot of sense? Like you know, might there be like use cases for say yeah, NFT like NFTs or like 
some DAOs or something for fractionalized real estate ownership inside of Singapore? Might there be um, use cases uh, like like use cases for like people? Like say like local artists uh, that might that might want to uh, use and like use NFTs as some way as a way of getting revenue. Um, possibly like DAOs that might be funding um, like art or cultural works of different kinds. So just to look at it kind of application by application and see what's worth doing. I think those are probably the two um, kind of biggest uh, things to um, things to focus on and like basically just try to see like you know what are the interesting things that can be done like what are some, what are the best ways to um, maximize the upsides of that what are the best ways to minimize the minimize the downsides of that um, you know, in general I'm optimistic that there are lots of things that can be done yeah and it's interesting because the crypto space tends to be anti-establishment but mm. there is these two spaces the government space and the crypto space mm. are are going to bump up against each other and central bank digital currencies and building out new financial systems, we all have to kind of talk to each other and write a new set of rules to make sure that we can all operate because it kind of plays for everybody's favor. But mm -hmm. it's difficult in some countries because the US is we're still using laws from 1934, uh, which make it tricky. And we kind of need to get to the situation where we've got a set of a, a, an open set of rules that allow us to adapt and change because it, it's so fast developing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. No, and I think the, uh, like the crypto space is a big space, right? And I think there's a lot of people with a lot of different visions. And I think there's, there's room for all of those visions in the space. Um, and like, I, you know, it's, and even kind of to the extent that it that it is kind of anti-establishment, like it's it doesn't even necessarily need to be about like getting rid of the uh, establishment completely. It's uh, uh, I think another kind of possible angle to look at that is it's about creating a kind of more fair ways for people to um, interact with existing institutions. And, um, you know, like, yes, ways where existing institutions have less opportunities to um, exercise control, and especially in ways that abuse people. Um, but at the same time, when, you know, ways where they can still you know, provide important services, um, ways where it's easier for new institutions to break or or existing institutions to break into markets where there's currently incumbents that have a that have a kind of very strong seat in the middle because they control the interfaces and crypto is not going to let anyone uh, control the interfaces to the same extent because it's all about creating these open base layers um, so no i think in general there's like lots there's lots of opportunities for all of like both institutional and uh, not uh, not institutional actors trying to compete with the institutions to participate. Yeah, absolutely. So just as we wrap up in the final minute or so, what are you most excited about right now? What is the thing that you go, wow, okay, um, this is really cool? Um, I mean, one is blockchain scaling, um, like just being able to to bring the space up to um, you know hundreds of millions of users, but with the like you know low costs that blockchains had back in 2014 and 2015. Um, another is zero knowledge proof technology. Um, zero knowledge proof technology, I think, is like, going to be a huge boon for privacy, for um, also for scalability. Um, so, um, a third would be just kind of the general growth of uh, DAOs and the like the the realization that there's different ways to have DAOs. So like just going beyond kind of just the cookie cutter, like everyone copies the. Don't know who's frozen. I don't know if it's me or Vitalik that's frozen. I think Vitalik's frozen. So I think we'll be wrapping up from here um, as the clock's counting down. So apologies for the last minute cutoff, but uh, I hope you all found it very interesting and thanks very much. Our thanks to Raul and Vitalik for that insightful discussion.